All right. Good evening. Welcome. Tonight we're going to do uh, Vyasa, the Mahabharata, and Hinduism. Again, in 50 minutes or an hour, should be no problem. Um, I, I was pondering this, and you know, it's hard to say that something is the greatest or the best. I think it's sort of uh, intellectually suspect claim, but in the world's epics, uh, if the Mahabharata is not the greatest, I don't know what is. It's, I mean, we have the Iliad and the Odyssey, spectacular. We have the Epic of Gilgamesh, amazing. The Shanama Ferdusi, which may be the next great epic behind the Mahabharata, the great classic works of China, the Tale of the Genji, the Dream of the Red Chamber. I mean, we have this collection of phenomenal works from all these cultures from around the world. And yet the Mahabharata is this just phenomenally rich, uh, an unbelievably long, uh, which we'll discuss, work. And whenever uh, I read it, and if you read it, which I hope some of you will, what you'll realize is that it is not us. We are not they, they are not us, we know. And there's a big difference there. And you often hear the, this division of the East and the West. This is nonsense. Uh, th this is not Chinese literature. This is not Western literature. There are at least three major cultures in the world. I would argue there are more than that, but certainly the billion people in the Indian subcontinent whose culture derives from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana certainly are neither the East nor the West. They are themselves, right? It's, it's another whole rich vein of cultural heritage that, like Chinese tradition, has flown unbroken for, you know, 3,000 years. And the Mahabharata is the inheritor of that incredible span of time. And so when we read it, we're really dipping into, again, one of the great, if not the greatest epics in the world, um, but also this entire cultural tradition that informs the lives and thoughts and outlooks of co contemporaneously a billion plus people and through two to 3,000 years of cultural history. So it is just this phenomenal opportunity and yet little known in the West. It is, it is not well known. Uh, I mentioned on the lecture on Taoism that we love Taoism and particularly the Tao Te Ching because it's so short. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so beautifully easy to read and short. The Mahabharata is precisely the opposite. Um, in its entirety, it encompasses 18 volumes. It's something like 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. Um, but you need not read it all. This is the fortunate thing. Uh, generally, I suggest reading entire works, and this time you get a free pass. Uh, so first, I just want to start with a little background on the Mahabharata, and then we'll dive into the content and the meaning. It's, it's on the back page there. Um, the, the main core narrative of the Mahabharata is the uh, Kurukshetra War, as, which is the central narrative. It's like the Iliad. In, in many ways. It's a civil war um, of the Kuru clan, hence Kurukshetra, which is the war of the Kurus. It's a civil war of a family, in fact, a set of brothers. And that seems to relate, like the Iliad, to a likely historical event that was then turned into an epic poem that probably reached a sort of stable form around 800 BC, between 800 and 400 BC. Now, what's interesting about that, this is precisely the timeline of the Iliad. This is the, the Iliad reaches back to the early Bronze Age, probably reached an oral form under the authorship of Homer, quote unquote authorship of Homer, um, and was passed down orally until it was written down, similar with the Mahabharata, the central narrative of, of the Kurukshetra. Um, Around 400 to 200 BC, the influence of sort of the second big civilizing and city building wave of India influenced that poem and brought a lot more material in because you have the rise of Jainism and Buddhism, which we talked about last time. And so this is where the uh, parts of the Bhagavad Gita are interpolated into the poem. It's clearly a later edition. Um, and then over the next 800 years, 
more material is added as, as this civilization spreads, there's outside influences coming in until it's probably stabilized in something like its modern form around 400-ish CE. Uh, so, you know, 1600 years ago. The earliest written manuscripts that we have are from 900 CE. But those are clearly copies of, of earlier versions that go back probably to around 400. But what happened over this entire, what is that, 2,000 year span until we get some actual written documents is it kept accreting material. It kept, so you had the central narrative of the Kuru family, a clan, and the war in it, but it just it collected legal history and geography and economics and politics and lots of religious speculation until it became 18 volumes. And so it's just this encyclopedia of the world. And it's amazing to read on one hand, but on the other hand, it's baffling because they're always off on some tangent. And so again, one of the things I'll recommend is you read one of the nice, uh, um, not, it's not a summary, they just take all of lots of that accreted material out and it leaves you with around a six to 800 page central narrative. And so when we think of the Mahabharata, in fact, when most Indians think of the Mahabharata, that's what they think of. Because no one outside of scholars and specialists read the entire 18-volume work. It's the central core narratives that really are what hold people's interests. And so there's many translations of these, and I'll talk about at the end, but that's the heart, and that's what I want to talk about. But, just be, 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 but no, the Mahabharata itself includes everything. It is the universe. It's all there. I mean, you don't need to read anything else, really. It's like an encyclopedia. It's just vast. And so anything you say about the Mahabharata is wrong because some other part of the Mahabharata actually contradicts whatever you... I mean, it's just because it's 18 volumes and it was written and, and orally translated over a period of 2,000 years. And so it's just this vast, growing, amazing, rich, confusing, baffling work. But the core narrative, which we're going to talk about in the Kurukshetra War, is, is the part that people think of. These are the stories. Uh, if we were in India now, these are the stories we would know. It's on TV all the time. Movies are made about it all the time. Books are written. There's comic strip series. They're in the newspaper. The references to this are everywhere. The, the ideals of Hindu society are here. So to the work itself. Um, Vyasa is the both reputed author, he dictates the story uh, to Ganesh, the god, um, who writes it down, and then there's stories within stories of people telling the story inside the story. But Vyasa is the key because, like Homer, he's the author uh, of this, and he's also the grandfather and father of pretty much most of the main characters. So this is really the story of the children and grandchildren who fight the war of Vyasa, who narrates the story to the god Ganesha. So it has this strange framing around it. There's actually additional framing, but that's the key framing that you get. And so if you hear Vyasa, the author of the Mahabharata, he is the author in the sense that he wrote the tale, and he is the author in the sense that he created the people. They are his offspring who are in fact the major players in the epic. So it's a very strange and different kind of way to approach this. It's, it's, it's quite interesting and wonderful. Um, and when you read this, what you'll discover, I started with a quote here, oddly, from Dennis Diderot, the great enlightenment thinker. And Diderot said, man will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. <laughs> right? This is... This is the Enlightenment thinking uh, at its finest, at its most apt. And for us, particularly in the United States in many ways, we are children of the Enlightenment. We really have imbibed the ethical principles of individual freedom, what individual freedom means. I do not want external forces like priests and kings interfering with my capacity to express myself, to do what I want. It is the, my opportunity to do what I want in the way that I want to do it that makes me free and makes my life good. 
Hence, we must strangle the last king with the entrails of the last priest. <laughs> this is not what is in the Mahabharata. <laughs> the Mahabharata presents something really strikingly different, which is why it is, it's just not us. The core of the Mahabharata is the Dharma, the concept of the Dharma. And this is different from Dharma from Buddhism. I mean, it's related, of course, because Buddhism is sort of an offshoot here. Um, but their concept of Dharma, well, I, well, I'll give you the definition here, which you can read, uh, but it's really simply the universe is ruled by Dharma. There's no escaping Dharma. And Dharma means if you do what you're supposed to, when you're supposed to, in the way you're supposed to, good things happen, and if you don't, bad things happen. It's just that simple. Everybody, everything is subject to Dharma. There is no escape. So in Buddhism, this is what Buddhism offers that Hinduism does not, in theory. It said, oh, you can escape the wheel of Dharma. You can get off of this infinite revolving wheel. Hinduism's land, not so much. Um, there's one of the great stories that I love. I mean, again, there's an, almost an infinite number of stories in the Mahabharata, but one that exemplifies this and why it's so different from our conception, both of morality and of what it means to have gods, um, is there's this great uh, yogi, sage, priest. He's in a temple and he's deep in meditation. He's an ascetic. He's lived a pure life. He's revered. And some thieves have stolen gold from the king. It's a bit of a summary. Um, and they go by the temple and they see the yogi there deep in meditation. They think, ah, this is the place to hide the gold. No one will look here. And no one will suspect a yogi. And he's deep in meditation, won't notice. We're in business. So they hide the gold. Later on, the king's servants come looking for the gold. And they go in the temple and they see it. And they go, oh, this guy's not a yogi. He's pretending to be one. He's not a real sage. He's just pretending to be one so he can hide the gold. So we're going to tell the king. So they run back to the king and they say, King, look, this is a fake sage. He's not a real Brahmin. He's not true. He's just stole your gold and hiding it in the temple. What should we do? And the king said, impale him and bring back my gold. So, right, we've got it. They get some soldiers. They go over and they impale the yogi. And this wakes him up from his contemplation. <laughs> As it is like to do, right? When you're run through with a spear. Uh, and he turns to them and he says, why did you run me through with a spear? I was deep in meditation. Couldn't you see that? What is wrong with you? And they go, uh-oh. Maybe this guy really is a yogi because he doesn't seem to mind being run through with a spear. <laughs> so they go back to the king and they're like, oh, king, uh... He didn't die, and he doesn't seem to mind the spear that we ran through him. Probably real sage, yogi, right? And so the king's like, uh-oh, holy shit, we messed up. Let's go apologize right now. So the king goes running to the temple, and he says, look, I am so sorry. We did, we, it was a mistake. You see the gold? We figured you, oh, sorry. We're so sorry. And the yogi says, no, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Honest mistakes. The whole time he's impaled with a spear. <laughs> You know, not your fault, but I know whose fault I think it is. And I'm going to go talk to him. The king's like, great, well, thank you very much. They take their gold back and leave quietly. Uh, and the yogi goes up to visit the god of Dharma. And he goes to the god of Dharma, and he said, this is the god of Dharma himself. And he says, hey, what gives with the spear through me? Why? Why? Look, I'm good. I've been just. I'm meditating. I'm doing everything right, and I get run through with a spear. That seems unfair, unjust. What's wrong with you, God of Dharma? And the God of Dharma says, oh, yes, when you were a child, you killed some insects and you killed a bird. And so this is the suffering that I impose on you for that. And the sage says, no, that is bullshit. <laughs> 
you do not cause this kind of suffering for the sins of an innocent child. For the error of your thinking, I curse you and you will be reborn so that you can learn again in the wheel of life so you understand better. You've lost your way, God of Dharma. <laughs> And so he is reborn, and in the Mahabharata, he is Vaidurna. He is, he is the great counselor um, who, who tries to help prevent the war, the Kurukshetra. He's sort of a Cassandra-like figure because everybody asks his advice, and he says, oh, I wouldn't go gamble against the Pandava brothers. That will cause bad things. And they never listen to him over and over again. Good advice, never listen to him. But here's, the Dharma is so totally all-encompassing that even the god of Dharma is subject to Dharma. <laughs> no one can escape it. And this happens over and over and over again. We'll see a couple more examples in these stories. And so to get your Dharma right, you have to, do, again, do the right thing the right way at the right time. But your duty, your obligations, are built around who you are, both caste, although we'll talk a little bit about the caste system, your sex, male or female, your age, your job, who you're interacting with. So everyone has a different dharma because everybody is in a different place in the world doing different things at different age with different people. But figuring out your duty and then doing it is what you're about. Literally, this is what freedom is. You do not free yourself by getting rid of the priests and the kings. You free yourself by getting rid of all those things that interfere with you doing what you should do. And almost all of those come from the inside anger, lust, greed, envy, fear, laziness, all of the, you know, all of these problems. And so where the enlightenment tradition says throw off all of this exterior bondage, and that's what we've really focused on, the Hindu tradition says throw off all of that interior bondage. You free yourself by overcoming all of your baser instincts. This is what makes you great. And you rise in the wheel of Dharma in your various incarnations by becoming increasingly good. And you become increasingly good by becoming increasingly better at fulfilling your duty without feeling that it's being interfered with, again, by fear or lust or laziness or greed or hate or, or undue violence, anger. All of these elements, you must put them aside. Because the only question that you try to answer, and this is why you ask sages and the Brahmins, the people who know, what is my duty? What is the best way to fulfill it? If you do that, good things. If you don't, bad things. It's, a, it's almost the reverse. It, it doesn't talk about freeing you from external pressures. In fact, it, it doesn't care about the external pressures. The external is irrelevant. It is truly focused on your internal being. And the great culmination of this is in the, in the beginning of the Kurukshetra War, which is the center of this again, Arjuna, who is the leader of one faction, one of the brothers of, of, of one faction, the Pandava brothers, five of them, well, there's kind of six, but we'll talk about five at the moment, um, is riding into battle, but he's actually going to battle with his half-brothers, his uncles. They've all grown up together. They all know each other. And Arjuna says to the gathered he says as he goes into battle before the gathered host, he turns to his charioteer, Krishna, who is an incarnation, the avatar of Vishnu. He says, you know what? I don't want to kill 
my relatives. There is no empire, no wealth, no fame, no glory, nothing in this earth or in heaven that is worth it to me to kill my brothers, my great uncles who are wise and glorious and, and, and noble. Even though our right to the kingdom is unassailable, it's not worth it. I'm not going to fight. And he, he lowers his arrow and the strength goes out of him. And Krishna says, mm, no, 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 no. You need to kill your family. This is a central argument. You need to kill your family because you're a warrior. It's warrior caste. You're a warrior. It's a just war. That's all you need to know. It's your duty to fight and to kill in a just war. If you do not do your duty, that is bad. Even if it means killing your own family, whom you love and respect. <laughs> That's how far this goes. This is not, I said, that we talk about duty and fulfilling your role appropriately. It, all the way, the central moral question here, or one of them, I mean, it's got all of them, but one of the really big ones that comes forward at this moment is, should I kill my family? And Arjuna, to his credit, you know, we would think, says no. Well, that turns out to be the wrong answer. <laughs> And there's a hundred brothers on the other side, of whom three, I think, survive. I think they kill 97 and three survive. And one, they have one sister. There's 101 of them. She, the sister survived. Plus they kill countless uncles. <coughs> and almost the entire Pandava army is, is destroyed. And in the process of this, unbeknownst to them, they actually end up killing one of their own brothers. They didn't know he was their brother. Duty. That's what matters. If you fail in your just duty that you understand rightly, bad. Even in that most extreme case, This is what makes the Bhagavad Gita such a central, important part, even though part of it is a later interpolation, to the whole, why? Why would you ride out and kill those who you actually love and care for? Because that's your job, that's your duty, rightly understood. See, we, ah, woo, that, that, see that, that we just don't think that. Right? We just say, no, you question your duty, you throw off the duty. Who is this to impose duty on me? Who came up with this caste system anyway? Fie on that. No. No, that's our response. Throw off the external shackles. Krishna says, look, you misunderstand the world. If you think, one, if you think you're killing anybody, you're wrong. You're killing their physical incarnation, which does not matter. You know the soul is immortal. You know the wheel is going to go around again. So, so just kill them because that's right and you're actually sort of helping them because you're freeing them to start another life in which they can do better. Which, wow, I don't know, you know, that, but that's the argument. It's the, this is sort of, uh, you know, it's there. Bhagavad Gita is very short. You can read this. Uh, and then they go through some different arguments and then finally, uh, Vishnu reveals himself. It's very much like the passage in Job, where Job says, this doesn't make any sense to me, it's all irrational. And God comes to him and says, ha, I am God. And Job says, oh, okay. Right? That is, it has, the Vishnu passage has very much that sense to it, where Vishnu reveals himself as the universe, the thousand-headed God, and sort of Arjuna sort of just freaks out. It's like, wow, okay, right, whatever you say, fine, I'm going. Um, and then the battle commences. So duty, 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 some more duty, understanding your duty, and then doing your duty is what this is about. It comes up again and again. Another aspect of it, that's the core. Really, if you want to understand the core and why it's different from us, our inheritance 
that you get freedom by throwing off external shackles and doing what you want is roughly the opposite. Here you try to find out what the external framework you're supposed to fill is and you throw off all the internal inhibitions that then allow you to fulfill that gloriously. <coughs> so this is one element uh, that is significantly different from us. Um, another one is in, in a way that's almost hard to entirely articulate is wealth is people. Over and over and over again, the Mahabharata emphasizes that the greatness of your life, the joy, pleasure, power, riches that you will experience are the people in your life. The five Pandava brothers and their wife, they have one wife, Draupadi, uh, are, are exiled for 12 years in the wilderness. And while they're there, Arjuna is sort of the handsome one everybody likes the best. There's one that's even more handsome, but they kind of like Arjuna the best. He says, you know, we're going to have to go fight, so I'm going to go up to the Himalayas and do some meditation and try and find some weapons and, and get ready to go. And so he leaves. And they all get really sad. And they're like, you know, we don't mind being exiled here in the wilderness when we're all together. We have Draupadi, our beautiful wife. We have our brothers. But now that Arjuna's gone, the joy has gone out of our lives. It's not being exiled that's bad. It's not having those we love and care for around us. This is what's bad. Being surrounded by those who are noble and good and wise makes your life good. Not being around them makes your life bad. And I'll give away, spoiler alert, if you read the 18 volumes, I'll give away <laughs> the, the big end is where, of course, the Pandava brothers have to, to die and, and the most noble, the leader of them, the eldest Yudhishthira, uh, they go and they have all these tests and challenges and each of the other brothers fail on their road to paradise, essentially. But Yudhishthira makes it and when he's there, he's taken down briefly to hell and he sees his other brothers there in hell, suffering. And they say, but you've made it, so you can go back to heaven. And he says, no, no, I would rather suffer in hell with those I love and care for than be in heaven on my own, because there's nothing greater or more noble than being with my brothers. And that was his final test. The final test was to recognize that being in heaven alone is no heaven. There's no paradise. It's only a paradise if you're with your brothers. So then they all go up and they start reading. They're all gods, by the way. This is another thing we'll have to talk about. Um, <laughs> well, they're all children of God, so there's a whole reincarnation. But that powerful emphasis on being with those you care about, who give you wisdom, who grant you insight, um, as wealth, as true wealth, as the foundation of the quality of your life, is the, uh, the second part that I think we completely and totally miss. Because I think we just essentially never think of people as wealth. Because right? we think of wealth as money. And that we use money to buy things that make our lives good, and we know we're not supposed to buy people bad. Ipso facto, people cannot be wealth. And so somehow people just seem to not matter. And so we just, oh, well, you know, sure, there's going to be people around. I'll have friends. I'll have a family. I'll... They just seem to sort of, as long as I get a Mercedes Benz, everything else will fall into place. <laughs> right? If I get a big car that's expensive, then I'll have so many friends around, I'll just shove them in the trunk and we'll be, it'll be great. <laughs> right? I don't know. I don't, but somehow, right, that's our idea, that if I pursue money and wealth and I get it and I fill it all with, with wealth and fill my life with all these big things, then somehow all the great people will follow and then my life will be good. Uh, the, the Mahabharata, I mean, 
endlessly warns us, warns us against this. No, no, no. Wealth misleads you. Power doesn't make you more able to appreciate people and bring good people into your life. It makes it harder for you to do this. It is a threat to your judgment. And when you threaten your judgment, what you do is you insult the people around you who you should value, or you treat them poorly, or you forget, and then they leave, and then all your power goes away. Again, in another passage that is just not us, Indra, king of the gods, right? So the, the sort of the Zeus-like figure. Now, but the Indra is very important in the passages of the Mahabharata that come from the earlier oil tradition, because he goes back, it is more significant in the Vedic tradition, which is earlier, and he becomes sort of less important as you go through time. Like I said, this is an epic that's composed over a thousand years. And so it's like Vishnu becomes very much more important at the end. He just doesn't appear early on. You know, he, he just sort of comes in later. Sort of, he was late. He missed the bus, got there late. Uh, um, so Indra is there. He's the king of the gods. He is noble. He is all powerful. Ah, I'm doing great. Ah, power is the beginning of your downfall. And his guru, his sage at the court there, comes in one day. And Indra thinks, I don't need to rise and show him respect because I'm king of the gods. And so his court sage, his guru, goes, ah, don't respect me anymore. Fine, I'll leave. And just leaves. Doesn't argue, doesn't fight, doesn't create a fuss. He just goes away. And all of a sudden, everybody goes, ooh, that's bad. And so sort of Indra's power begins to fade. People realize that he doesn't know what to do. He, he's made a mistake. He's ostracized and alienated someone who cared and guided him, helped him with wisdom in his arrogance of power. And so he goes looking for him, but the guy made himself invisible, so he cannot be found. So they say, well, what should you do? And he asks around, they say, oh, oh by the way, and so the uh, demons begin attacking. There's demons here, the sewers. Um, they begin attacking, and so things are going very poorly for the gods. They're like, wow, we need a new guru. And so they advise to get a new guru, and they do. But this guru is the, the, the uh, half demon, but he's good. And so he advises, and everything sort of returns to being good, but Indra never quite trusts him, suspects him of still sort of siding with the demon secretly. So, being stupid and not having read the Mahabharata, Indra kills him. Oh, big mistake. Big mistake. This is not going to work. Arrogance. Fear. Envy. This is what undoes you. And so the father of this guru is like, right, and creates a demon, Vitra, with the whole point is to kill Indra. And this demon is really, really bad news. And so lots of fighting and all kinds of complications ensue. You know, these are long stories. Um, but it finally takes the intervention of Vishnu to help Indra to kill Vitra. And they only do that by tricking him. Because Vitra actually said, you know what, this fighting is silly. And they're like, yeah, why are we fighting? Why don't we be brothers? And Vitra says, I can do that, but I don't trust Indra, which shows that he was right, even as a demon. Because Indra finally can't trust him anymore, sneaks around, and with the help of Vishnu, kills him with foam. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, but it is a, it's a long story. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but the idea here is, again, um, Indra had, had failed with doubt, fear, greed, power, arrogance, always the same thing. Whether you're a god or you're the lowliest human, it's the same thoughts that drive us down. And generally they drive us down because they alienate us from our friends. That's, that's the karmic effect that we suffer immediately, is when we fail uh, in building our community. And so I, it, I was reminded of this as I was reading this, because I was talking to some um, tech people in the Bay Area, and they're trying to come up with a program to help build communities. Right? And so they're uh, talking to me about this, and I thought, that, that's fascinating. 
right? We, we feel like we need an external intervention to help us build good communities where we can interact and have conversations and meet people and sort of reconnect because we are so alienated, right? We are so isolated and lonely. In fact, uh, in England, I believe they just created an official government office of loneliness. <laughs> I mean, no, because it, it's such a problem. That, that's how isolated we've become. And this is the tradition of the Enlightenment. It's a logical extension of the Enlightenment, by the way. I'm big on the Enlightenment, but this is the logical extension of it. If external things and forces keep me down, kings and priests, laws, well, other people, what's more oppressive than other people? I mean, the family has to be the most oppressive institution ever created. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't it just? Think about that. We're, we're, we're oppressed. I mean, we're, we're defenseless. We're just little hopeless babies. I mean, this is the problem with being human is you're totally, you can't survive for the longest time. Other animals, a day or two days or a week or maybe a month, and boom, they're good to go. Turn them loose in the wild, they'll thrive. Humans, yeah, what does it take us? 50, 60 years before we're ready to go? I mean, it, it takes a long time. And so we have, these, we have these relationships that are necessary but also oppressive and binding and, and, ah, and we have no rules for them. And so we've decided that you're 18, goodbye, good, we're done. Well, wash our hands of you, ha ha, off you go. Right? It was strange, it's a strange concept, but, but we have no rules. We don't have a series of mutual obligations that we can kind of negotiate or feel our way around. And so something that's necessary is felt to be primarily oppressive. And so we go, oh, I leave my family, now I'm free, yay, I'm free to be myself alone. What? <laughs> this again this is never in the history of mankind being alone has never seemed like a good thing if, if you wanted to punish somebody in the ancient world besides killing them the worst thing you could do was exile them you must go out in the world alone without your family and friends that was literally the worst punishment now we're like, it's a rite of passage. Look, I've been exiled by me. <laughs> and, and, it, and we just think any variation from that is crazy. A Russian mathematician who recently solved an important math problem um, turned down a big monetary prize and moved back to St. Petersburg to live with his mother. And everybody thought, well, he must be nuts. He's another insane mathematician. Because anyone who voluntarily chooses to live with their family is clearly nuts. Right? I mean, wow, think about that. So that's why we have an office of loneliness. That's why we have the necessity, I would say, the great need of creating, you know, technological or other systems to help us reconnect with people. The Mahabharata is perfectly clear on this. Your wealth, your power, your joy comes from the quality of the people you surround yourself with. And if in your arrogance or fear or envy or sloth, you either recruit poor people, not poor, not mean wealthy, but poor in, in quality, or you alienate everybody, ah, well, then you're going to be on your own. And that, as far as Mahabharata is concerned, and probably human health and psychology is concerned, is really a bad place to be. And there's almost no exception to this. So if, if you turn over the back, I give you this brief family tree of the Kuru dynasty. Um, and now the, the Kauravas, all the way over down the lower left, the main brother there is uh, Duryodhana. Now there's a hundred of those brothers. They were born at once. It was, must have been a really hard childbirth. Uh, they were born... <laughs> All at once, uh, and and one and and the Pandavas who are the other side, Arjuna, Bhima, and Yudhisthira were the most important ones, uh, and then the two uh, beautiful Nakula and Shadeva, they're there but they don't play a big part. 
But they're all virgin births, by the way. I, I love this. They, you know, we talk about the virgin birth. And they had six virgin births from two different mothers. Now that's talking. Let's, let's just get this virgin birth rolling. Um, but they are they're born of the sun god, um, from the wind god. You know, for, they're born from all these different gods. Um, Karna is one of the Pandava brothers, but he doesn't know it. And he becomes friends with uh, Duryodhana, who treats him well. Krishna, or, or Arjuna sort of insults, not sort of insults him, definitely insults him. Um, and, and Duryodhana treats him well and welcomes him. And they're friends for years. And so when the battle comes, uh, the, their mother finally comes to him and says, look, your brothers with the Pandavas don't fight with Duristra's sons. And he says, you know, Duryodhana has treated me well and been my friend for my whole life. I'm not going to abandon him now, even though I'm pretty sure we're going to lose. You don't abandon your friends. And even though he's probably in the wrong, I don't want to betray him. I want to stick with him. And by the way, where the hell have you been all these years? <laughs> you sort of left me out in the cold, and now you want me to abandon him for your other sons because you're afraid I'm going to kill him, which is exactly the case. And so he swears an oath. I will only kill Arjuna because he's the one who insulted me. That way, at the end of the war, you will have five sons no matter what happens because if Arjuna kills me, you'll have five sons. If I kill Arjuna, you'll have five sons. But don't expect me to abandon my friends now like you abandoned me then. I'm not going to do it. And so he, of course, is killed in the course of this. And then when the other Pandava brothers find out they've killed the brother, they did not know this, they're just overcome with grief. So, you know, you, that notion of friendship and, and it's connected with family, even to the family bond, right? There's this tension. But over and over again, the question is asked, who should you be loyal to? Why? How do you build a good family group? Who do you take with you? Who's important to you? Who do you defend and trust and support? And who defends and trusts and supports you? It runs as the central theme. And so building a community that lasts and is stable is seen as core to this whole process of dharma. By filling your duty to other people, People trust you and love you and value you, and your life is good. And we don't need a program to do that. Well, we have a program, it's called Dharma. We need a program because we don't have one, right? We need an app to help us do this. But the <laughs> emphasis there is overwhelmingly powerful. It's, it's really quite shocking. Um, So yeah, this this uh, so, so those I, I don't know that, that that emphasis on the value of the human and by extension the value of the human community that is built by fulfilling duties that are appropriate to your position. In, at every step, we just don't believe it. I, I, I've mentioned this, I believe, in other lectures, but I'm always shocked to say, when we go to college, I talk to my students about this, when we go to college, what college do you go to? The best one that chooses you. Somebody else decides where you go to college in this instance. And who do you leave behind? All your friends and family. You allow an institution to decide where you're going to go and that you should leave your friends and family to do that. Historically, this is bizarre. It's a very strange concept. Because if one college accepts me, I'll go there. If five college accepts me, I have some choice. But other people have presented those choices to me. And they don't even have, as far as I can tell, there's no way to say, hello, college. My six friends and myself are applying to your school. If you accept all of us, we will come. If you reject even one of us, we will not because we will be going together. And we will go to whatever school accepts all six of us. This is what the Pandava brothers would do. By the way, this is how they ended up with having five brothers and one wife. 
Because they, early on, they swore that they would not fight amongst themselves for the kingdom because they could see we will share everything equally amongst us. And then when it became time to, marry, to get married, they said, no, we're not going to violate this oath. We will share everything amongst us equally because that's what's most important because we don't want to create enmity amongst the brothers. And so Draupadi has, has famously the five, the five husbands. And to, to us, this is madness. Polyandry, this is called, by the way. It's the, opposite of, it's, it's the opposite of polygamy. There's also polygamy in here because Vyasa has several wives from whom all these children come from. They're not really wives. He has several women he sleeps with under an, an odd arrangement having to do with... Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's very complicated. Uh, uh, but Vyasa sleeps with several different women. One closes her eyes and hence Dhrishtarashtra is born blind and one blanches and so the Panda is, is, is born pale. Uh, and so, you know, these, how these things go when Vyasa goes to sleep with them. Um, but the, the notion is that, you know, we want to keep the family together and that bond is most important to keep the brothers together or to keep the friends together, keep the community together. And we'll do anything, including sharing a wife, to make that happen. See, for us, that's too great a sacrifice. But everything is too great a sacrifice for us, almost, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Right? I, I, you read these articles about, well, how do you do a long-distance relationship when both of you, the husband and the wife, are offered great career opportunities in different cities? Because, of course, you have to take those career opportunities. And so how do you keep the relationship alive when somebody's in Detroit and someone's in Los Angeles? It's like, that's just stupid. <laughs> I, I really, I, I hate to say that. I just... I'm, I, you know, I just think that's a wrong decision. It, I mean, honestly, I think someone has gone wrong in the head. It's not, oh, we'll just for years be separated by a few hundred miles voluntarily because of careers. Uh, okay, I mean, it's a free country. See, the Enlightenment. You can choose to do any stupid thing you want and damage yourself by putting yourself isolated in a city where you don't know anybody to pursue what? A career? So this would be the ego. This would be the arrogance. This would be the search for power. Right? Now, the downside of this, of course, in, in the Hindu tradition, the woman would just sacrifice herself because that's what women are for. Um, but, but if we, uh, yeah, if we read it outside of that in the greater context, um, then it really is just raises this fundamental question. Why would you sacrifice your partner, who you've said you loved, voluntarily married, in theory, um, for these goals, money, Respect, career, ego. Mahabharata says, oh, bad, 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 bad. You're just going to get bad karma. And what you find is yourself alone in an apartment in a major American city, <laughs> and you wonder why. And you go, oh, well, there you, there you go. Wheel of Dharma. You've been cursed. <clears throat> right? And that, but that concept, again, is just virtually alien to us. We, we just don't believe it. Uh, and so, by the way, I should mention... Uh, caste. Caste comes up in here, but it's important to note that the Indian caste system, um, for most of the period in which the Mahabharata was written, was relatively loose. They had Brahmin, which are just holy men, and it's pretty clear that people could become holy men who are not necessarily born to it. And there's passages that say this specifically. Um, then you had the warrior caste, which is mostly an aristocracy, because clearly there wasn't enough people in the warrior caste to, to fight all the battles. Mm -hmm. So most of the soldiers must have not been warrior caste. It's really the elite leaders. So they, they functioned as a, an aristocracy. But like Karna, uh, who is the son of the sun god, was <laughs> abandoned in wreaths who were then gathered by a farmer. It's, it's an interesting echo from the Old Testament, wondering which way that story went. Uh, but he is raised by farmers, so he is definitely not the w warrior caste. But when he goes, Duryodhana sees him. Arjuna says, I want nothing to do with you, your lower caste. And Duryodhana, who's in theory the bad guy, but not really in some ways, says, no, look at him. He's a noble person. You just look at him and he knows he's noble. I will befriend him. 
Is not beneath me to be friends with someone who is brave and courageous and mighty and noble? So the, the caste system is there, but it's not what we think of as this very rigid. Um, a lot of that was, was, was brought in with the Mughal Empire and then really reinforced by the British because they realized this is a good way to rule. Um, and so what we think of as the modern caste system um, is a relatively, the idea is not new, but the strict enforcement of it um, is, is pretty recent uh, in historical terms, right? So, 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 so these narratives that are in here uh, emphasize and are alien to us because they run counter to our own traditions, to our own assumptions. But it's counter along these lines that uh, what, what should I ask myself is not what do I want to do today, but what should I do today? What duties can I fulfill for my friends and my family? But not in the sense of sacrifice. Right? Whenever we talk about this, we say, oh, I'll sacrifice myself for my children. People always say this, I'll sacrifice myself for my children. I'm like, well, that's nice. Put that on your kids. Right? There's, a, there's a, 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 a nice load of guilt. I sacrificed myself so you, you know, it's like, yeah, I walked uphill to school in the snow mile, you know, you're like, all right, yeah, whatever. Um, but, you know, they sort of load this guilt on our children. No, you're supposed to gladly do it. You're supposed to be pleased to have the opportunity to serve. But see, we don't think of that. And in, in the Mahabharata, this is what liberation looks like. The opportunity to serve is great. This is why they're always the, the priests and the sage and the wild guys out in the jungle. Uh, you know, ascetics, Vyasa himself, who's this sort of stinky, long-haired ascetic from the woods, this is, this is why the women, like, when they say, oh, you got to sleep with Vyasa, they're like, what? Oh, come on. They know they have to, but like one closes their eyes and one blanches, you know, and it's because it's they're like, but, but see, you're supposed to be pleased to have the opportunity to serve. And we're like, Ugh. that doesn't sound like liberation. That sounds like voluntary enslavement, right? And, that, and so we struggle with that. But part of it is we don't have a theory of reincarnation that we're going to come back, that, that we will have a chance to come back. And for the god, like I said, uh, the god of Dharma incarnates in the Mahabharata as a character who dies. It's everybody. Indra, in the story that I told you, at one point he gets so upset about what's happened, he goes into hiding. And he becomes a single cell of a lotus plant in the furthest jungles of India. <laughs> And his wife has got to go find him because they're going to marry her off to this other guy that she does not want to marry, but she will if it's her duty. But she's like, Indra, you've got to come back and help me out here. And she finally finds him, but he's, a, he's, he's been incarnated as a single molecule in a lotus plant. That's how bad he messed up. <laughs> right? I mean, that is really, really, really way down there. Right? This is bad. Um, and, and so that, you know, so everybody, so this, this is, if, if you serve right, eventually, it, but you will be rewarded. But even that really doesn't catch the flavor of it, because generally you're rewarded now. Usually the, the, the benefits accrue to you immediately, because the cure for Arjuna leaving is to have Arjuna come back. That's the cure. The cure for loneliness is to have people around you who love you and, and, and making that possible and embracing that. Um, so those lessons from the Mahabharata are just profound but difficult for us to take in and they make it strange. Um, but I encourage you to, to read, if you can, read this. And I was going to give you a couple of translations here. Uh, the penguin one is fine. With the, with the warning, they tend to write through sections to try to compress things. And so it's this mix of the actual text and summary and actual text and summary, um, which is helpful. And I think it's about seven or 800 pages. Um, there's an excellent one uh, by Kamala Subramanian, Subra, oh, sorry, these names, Subramanian, 
um, which is about, what did I say, 900 pages, which is, which is longish, but, but a beautiful selection of text. And it really gives you the core. I would say that's the full core. Uh, there's another one by Raja Gopalachari. Uh, I'm sure that's not how you pronounce that. Um, and that's been edited down to about 300 pages. So if you want a shorter introduction, that, that is a, a, a great place to start. Um, but the, uh, the Penguin or the other one, like I said, about eight, 900 pages really gives you the whole picture. Uh, the shorter one doesn't even have the Bhagavad Gita in it, by the way, which is sort of unbelievable, but you've got to cut something. Yeah. Um, just a second, just almost. Um, best oh, sorry, I will. Okay, yeah, sorry, I will. Um, okay. So that that is um, just just how you get into get an introduction into it and to get a feel for it. But if you're going to read it, like I said, and I encourage you to do this. Keep this in mind that over and over again, you're going to see stories that go directions that you just you're like, what? Um, and, and the one I, I like sort of, or there's so many of them, but one of the famous one, Dropody. So the, the five brothers have been lured into a gambling game, a dice game that is rigged against them. Duradona is always trying to overthrow the Pandavas. And so this is his latest scheme. It's over and over and over again. Um, and he's rigged the dice game so that they're going to lose. And Yudhishthira, despite his great nobility, gambles away everything. He gambles away all the empire, their wealth, then he gambles away his brothers. Then he gambles away himself. <laughs> and finally, he gambles away his wife. Now, this is wrong. You're not supposed to gamble away your brothers or your wife. So they say, go get Dropody and bring her here to, to the hall where all the men are gambled for this gambling game. And at first, no one wants to do it. They're like, oh, that is bad. They all realize it is an incredible breach. Finally, they get some people to do it, and they drag her in by her hair. Incredibly humiliating. And his arrogance says, I want her clothes, rip her clothes off here in front of everybody. And finally, the gods intervene and say no. And as they try to take her clothes off, there's an endless amount of it. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And coming. Right? Uh, and so it's just this like heartrending scene. And she says after it's over, I will never wash my hair or put it up. So she's going to let it grow in tangles until I wash it in the blood of one of the guys who had insulted her. And that is one of the scenes that comes in the end of the battle as they kill him rip all the blood out of his body and deliver it to Dropody, who then washes her hair in the blood. Right? And, and that's... A, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's both powerful because, A, you waited for it for about 4,000 pages, but it, it, it's also, you know, it, but, but it is this invocation of the curse that then comes... It's not... It, it's, she says it, she means it, and she does it. And they all support her in this. But it's just sort of way outside of our, you know, you know you're not supposed to like take the blood out of your enemies and wash your hair with it. <laughs> unless it's right and just for you to do so. And in her case, you kind of go, yeah, that seems OK. Because that was wrong. And so that is the punishment there fits the crime. There's this fittingness that comes up over and over again. So even when it goes so far outside what we would normally think was our heroine, our beautiful, loving heroine, to sit there with the blood of her enemies washing her hair is just, wow, what an incredible scene. And yet, within the context, it sort of comes like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, so unbelievably short uh, trying to deal with this, but I just wanted to give you a way, maybe an entree into this. So I, like I said, I encourage you to either watch, there's many film versions of this, or, or better yet, read one of the many adaptations. Um, but keep this in mind, that what you're encountering is a world where the assumptions run 
virtually contrary to our traditions of the Enlightenment. What we think of as the God is supposed to be singular in our case generally, um, very plural in their case, and the notion of what is good in life. What does freedom account for? What are people worth? What are we supposed to be pursuing? Their answers to all these very human questions are very different from ours. And so it produces this unparalleled epic of, of human failings and triumphs and just incredible magnificence and psychological depth and, and terror and joy and beauty uh, that it, it really is one of the great, if not the greatest gems uh, of world literature. So Vyasa, Mahabharata, and Hinduism, thank you. Thank you.